Welcome to see you here. We have a fantastic panel which will now exactly address these questions of really how do we increase access. At the same time, we will be trying to challenge the people also, how do we do so responsibly? This was the question of trust which just came up. For that purpose, I will first like to introduce Deputy Governor of the National Bank, Roman Borisenko, to the stage, please. He will obviously, thank you, he will obviously be representing really the regulator. And then we have a lot of private sector, both uh, public and private. Uh, next to join is the Deputy Chairman of Ashad Bank, Anton Chuchun. Good. Joined by the CEO Chairman of the Board of Privat Bank, Peter Krumhansel. Okay, that side, that's fine. Um, we also have from uh, Mr. Pavel Gudic Linsky, the Division President for Central and Eastern Europe for MasterCard. Good. Good to see you. Uh, we also have uh, another Pavel, Pavel Widawski, the Vice President of Cashless Poland. And finally, uh, Utam Nayak, the Emerging Markets Digital uh, Senior Director on Social Impact from Visa. Thank you all for joining. We will just follow a, a format just like in the previous session, which is everybody gets like a 10 minute presentation. Um, and then we'll focus on the, have a series of the six presentations run through. Uh, and then we'll go to a questions and answers session in which please, as you hear the presentations, Think of any questions you would like to ask the panel. And with that, I will hand over to Roman for the first. There's only one clicker, and I have now been asked actually to be the facilitate. Okay. Also, do you need a? Um, okay. Thank you. Доброго ранку всім, ще поки ранок. Я так розумію, що більшість аудиторії у нас україномовна, то я буду говорити українською. Бачу, що вже не більшість. Дивіться, я... це дуже почесно починати цю панель. Я вважаю, що я починаю панель з професіоналами. Хотів позвучити позицію на цьому. Я буду говорити на цьому НБІУ. Financial inclusion. How to understand it, interpret it? These are the three components of it. Accessibility, understanding, I mean financial literacy and trust. The last couple of items go together, necessarily. Speaking of accessibility or affordability, this country maybe well ahead of other countries in terms of payment technologies and uh, cashless payments. So it's not a big deal to us. It's not much of a problem which would account for the low rate of financial inclusion. Financial literacy and understanding. There has been a recent report which says that the financial literacy in this country is lower than the world's average and it's pretty much the same as it is in the neighboring countries I personally believe that the literacy here is better than the report suggests the younger generation at the age of 13 or 14 typically have a bank card and they can use it for something and it allows us to hope that soon this thing will be booming here. We also believe that this country needs a national financial literacy strategy and that's why the NBU initiates it and spearheads it. I think later on today you're going to see our proposals, our project that would like to discuss with the regulators and at the end of the day they should come up with a pool of stakeholders and partners for this project. 
було визначено як most importantly there is something that is key to this inclusion it is trust trust is based on knowledge and i think trust is about three major parts there should be rules of the game in place in the market in the sector there should be an appropriate understanding of these rules everybody needs to see what what are the rights and duties of every participant in the financial market and thirdly it's security and the clients need to understand if they are secured by respective supervisors and who can they turn to in case their rights have been breached so in the national bank we believe that trust matters and we have to be focused on that quite a lot in order to improve financial inclusion the existing NBU strategy carries a client-oriented focus. We create a value for external customers. At the end of the value chain, we can see Ukrainian citizens, the consumers of financial services. There are seven priorities in the strategy, and one of them is financial inclusion. Previously, we were rather focused on the two of these which is accessibility and technologies. So we would typically say that we need to enable cashless progress and we have to create a strategy of financial literacy. But nowadays, as was announced by the governor of the National Bank, we're opening up a new page in the activities of the National Bank. We're gonna protect the rights of consumers of financial services. Over the last couple of years, we have been expecting a draft law and it is getting prepared for the second reading. But right now, there is no decision of the Supreme Council and nothing is done about that. According to the existing mandate of the National Bank, as we speak about financial literacy and protection of financial consumers, there is nothing that we have on that. But trust in financial literacy should be in the focus of the NBU anyway, and that should be a part of our strategy. So what exactly we're going to do about this? We're going to launch a process protecting the financial consumers' rights. Pretty soon, maybe later on today, you will see some draft regulations which over a couple of months will be discussed with the financial community. It's going to be an open partnership and we're going to try and meet each other halfway in that. And towards the end of the year, these regulations will be effective and the National Bank will supervise the market, the behavior of financial institutions, banks primarily. And it will respond to failures, if any. I mean, if the rights are not going to be followed, we will issue recommendations, warnings, and even penalties, if it comes to that. But the mandate for that is missing right now, so it's going to be too hard to do. And we understand that under the existing mandate of banking supervision, which is based on corporate governance system, we have some powers as the central bank in this field and we can do something. So here is my point for the entire bank and financial community. You need to understand that we're trying to jointly build a financial ecosystem which will gain trust of end consumers those who get value from the system. So it's our joint effort and I think all of you should be interested in that. We need to set the rules of the game. 
and make sure they be followed. And just a few more words about a growing fintech. We can see some breaches happen in the non-fintech segment. It is typically it typically happens because of lack of transparency, non-disclosure of information. The fintech boom allows you to have extra accessibility of products and also it creates extra risks because consumers might potentially be less protected than they are outside the fintech segment. So we need to figure out a model which would be accepted in the market by the organizations offering services via particular tools and channels. And also we need to see what consumers should do. At the end of the day it should be a win-win situation. I pretty much like the case of the Dutch, uh, Ireland, Irish Central Bank. Before the crisis, trust to the banking system in that country was about 70%. When the crisis erupted in 2007 and 8, the banks began to manipulate the customer data and customer's money, so the trust went down and money left the banking system. Right after that, the central bank came up with the function protecting consumer consumers of financial services and uh, then they created a separate regulator for that over time. But over a few, over four years, they have been able to regain the public trust and deposits came back to banks and they would go back to even 80% of trust. So trust really matters the most and uh, let's try and build an ecosystem of financial sector which would be trustworthy across the end consumers and customers in the system. Thank you. first session which is really uh, trust and on two areas as you know it's uh, initiating this uh, financial literacy strategy but as I've also heard the National Bank has now recently established a consumer protection department which is grateful to hear uh, the well, I think we all agree the risks are there but first of all we need to have new products uh, to expand financial inclusion um, therefore, let me pass on to the next speaker on my list, which is uh, Anton Tutun from Oshan Bank. You have the microphone and you have the clicker if you need it. Not needed. Okay, very good. Then the floor is yours. Please tell us what Oshan is doing in terms of new products. Thank you very much. I also will talk to the Ukrainian because I have a lot of Ukrainian listeners. Okay, I'm going to speak uh, Ukrainian because most of the audience are Ukrainian speaking. So I'm going to tell you what we're doing in terms of these departments. It is believed that if you cut down on the number of branches, it's too bad. Well, our service model, if I can call it this way, was begun five years ago. It was pretty much like a savings bank principle. There is a window, you come to this window, you pay your utility bills. We made transformations in the chain. We have more than 600 branches, and in those branches you can do anything you need. So technically the chain is becoming smaller, but the existing branches offer a long list of services and in each of those branches you can get high quality service and uh, we can see a lot of progress being made in digital channels five years ago 80 percent of all transactions in a bank would happen 
in the cash desk in a bank branch. Right now, 57% of transactions happen distantly across service channels. So over five years period, there has, there has been a significant change because we've got all of the online services and the client can go to the branch once to make an agreement to complete identification and then they can use all of the digital services we offer. There has been a change in the service model, so in spite of making the chain kind of smaller, we're still, we're still doing better, I guess. And thinking of financial inclusion, I think we're the only bank which operates along the touch line, the demarcation line. We have mobile units which can go to the military stations in some of the villages where you cannot get an ATM because there is no way to place your ATM there. So we also have those mobile units operating in the checkpoints and people can place a deposit at the checkpoint right there on the spot. It's an important project for us and I think it also contributes to the growing financial inclusion in society. We've got 20 inclusive branches where everything is there for people with disabilities. So there is a self-service area where you get special ATMs with different kinds of functions. For example, I have seen a case where a blind woman was able to use the keypad tagging technology. So she used headphones and she has been able to withdraw some money from that ATM. She has been able to do it. She could have asked somebody else to do it, but in that setting she has been able to do it herself, a blind woman. So these guys are just like anyone else in this country. So these might be simple things, but they make quite a difference and they make society better. But there is more to just having branches. Financial inclusion is primarily about accessibility of service. So we're talking digital, cashless economy. If we think of Nordic countries, they hardly ever use cash and that's where you get one of the highest GDP rates per capita and they have one of the highest happiness indices in the country. So naturally, it's not because they're totally cashless, but partly it's because of that. And we're doing a lot to make it happen. So they spoke of the project for Kiev subway and we did it gentle with MasterCard. Sixty-five million transactions have happened and it's been very convenient, you tap it and off it goes. At an annual conference in Las Vegas they have recognized this project as one of the best of its kind. In future we will try and cut down on cash in particular segments like micropayments, you still get a lot of cash used in all sorts of festivals. Last year Ukraine hosted Atlas Weekend and it's gonna happen this year again. More than 500,000 guests attended the festival. We provided a cashless solution and about 30 million of cash would be used cashless in that festival. We will think of some other festivals, Winter Country, Belief, Video Jira for young generation where they speak with video bloggers and things like that. We worked gently with international payment systems and we go to cities with that. In Kiev city it was funicular and Kiev and I think it's going to be a good step towards the development of cashless in this country. So these steps, these kinds of things allow clients to make payments and these projects have been successful.
Recently, there has been a research done by the NBU and the USAID. They looked into the financial literacy of the population, and I have been surprised to see that young generation in this country are the least financially literate in spite, in spite of all the smartphone things, the internet, and everything else. We try and do a lot in order to offer respective services and technologies in order to cover the young generation. There are digitally prepared cards that people can make without going to the bank. They have some limits, but they're convenient for youngsters. If you have got an account, a bank card, then you can get SMS messages, text messages. There is a mobile application. You can communicate with banks in financial parlance. You set limits, you speak with, with your folks. So that person becomes increasingly financially literate. In Mistetsky Arsenal, there is a good project going, which is called the Finance Laboratory. And you get hundreds of thousands of kids which would go there. There's a transparent ATM. Kids can withdraw money and they can see what's working inside of the ATM. There is a wad of cash. It makes you see what one million grivna looks like. It's made of one grivna bills. Well, there is a lot of interest, is interest and stuff there, which is of interest to children. And they get a better idea of the financial sector. So financial inclusion includes financial literacy. And we have to really make sure that the millennials, the younger upcoming generation, could have a better idea of all that. And lastly, one more point, it's about entrepreneurship. I'm speaking about an active portion of population which creates the added value of this country. They create jobs, they do not ask for anything in return, they just would like to operate safely and they will keep creating things on and on. We created a program which is called Build Your Own and a lot will have to be done. The new startups typically do not understand how to build a marketing strategy, a business plan, how to take care of all the accountancy things in order to get a loan from the bank and things like that. So all of that is a range of issues. But we keep in touch with these people, with these clients, and some of them are non-clients of the bank, but we still get feedback from them. We have some mentors for them, like sophisticated businessmen. They can give them some advice, share a video course. So I think as this moves on, the financial inclusion will be better in this country and it's going to have a significant impact. And the very last point, that's something for the future, I guess. I think there's going to be a significant increase in the financial literacy and inclusion when the law envisions a necessity to have an account with a bank. Maybe it sounds tough, but I think it's a sound financial protectionism of a kind. So at the age of 16, you might have an account and it's going to be mandatory. So a few years later, you might be financially literate person. We should not be afraid of that. It will help us keep moving on. Thank you. Thank you, Rich. Sounds great. Very happy to hear how you're taking the issue of, of helping seriously and providing special programs then also for the youth. And of course, very, very grateful to hear actually how much products have been the huge amount of going of cashless transversions are reaching a level of 57%, which is, um, which is really high. Um, Piotr, do you need a clicker? No, good. Okay, then I can stay seated. So let me pass on. So we're going now from the Oshad Bank, which has the largest branch work, then to Pudavat Bank, which probably has the second largest branch work, as Peter just told me. It's probably just as big. Um, but let's see the what you have. what is Pravat doing then to expand financial inclusion in Ukraine. Over to you. Is it better? Okay, thank you very much. So uh, I would like to talk a little bit about Privat Bank and what we do. Uh, we have strategy as a team in Privat Bank that we rather talk less and we do more. 
And uh, last year we have decided that we would like to do something concrete. So we joined forces with MasterCard and we started a pilot project where we went to pre-selected village in the Dnipro region and we tried to implement really the things. We have heard that uh, the problem are the costs, that the problems is that the people have to go to the branch. So we tried vice versa. We tried that we visited each person in the village and we tried to talk to them and tell them what they can do. We gave everything free of charge. We even created some financial motivation for them. And uh, as a result, I would like to show you what, what was the result. So the movie, please. Film Budlaska. Маленьке Волоське на Дніпропетровщині є рідним для півтори тисячі людей. Це типове українське село. Саме у таких мешкає 30% українців. It is important to have drinking water in the house and some kind of banking service, some kind of medical basic services. You don't have to feel like you're living in the village, which is out there in nowhere. In every store there is a terminal, and not just a terminal, it is something that allows you to pay in the modern way, through a smartphone, through Google Pay. You can tie your bank card to that. I have been using this ever since it has been offered. More than 50% of local purchases in stores are done cashlessly. Private bank terminals are there for adults and kids. All of the high school kids get the junior cards of the bank. In the high school, we no longer use cash in payment for lunches in the canteen. So all kids have junior bank cards and kids use them to pay for breakfast, lunches using private bank cards. It's very convenient both to kids and their folks and it's good for the high school administration and local government because when there is then there is no abuse there. So a rural school became a smart school but further on they would like to install turnstiles in order to see when kids came to school and left it. Parents will get text messages about the movements of their kids. This is the village hall. People come here to get some solutions. There is a gym. There are some books in there. Children and kids always have something to do there. They installed an ATM of private bank and it changed the life of the village tremendously. Most of the paychecks go to the cards and it's too expensive to go to the city. You have to use the bus, but it's 21 grim the one way. But now you can go to the ATM, get the money and pay your utility bills. You can transfer money somewhere and you can do it very quickly if need be. If you go to the post, it's not very convenient. It only works twice a week. But through this ATM, you can transfer the money very rapidly. There is a personal office in the utility and it will allow people to monitor backlog of payments online. Some people might get their pensions on the bank card. Every pensioner gets a monthly 50 grivna bonus to their account from private bank. It's 600 grivna per person per year. Many still haven't abandoned the post office services. But other people, although elderly, preferred the card. I used the private bank card ever since I got I started getting pension. It's very convenient. They have lots of plans about smart village development in partnership with private bank. They would like to use the card to pay for stuff in stores and even in local buses. We're negotiating this with the bank. We want to install the validators and 
it will allow us to use the cards to pay cashlessly for taking a ride in the local bus. They're buying a container for renting bicycles. All of the bicycles will be identifiable through the bank card. The system will see the collateral. Once the bicycle has been returned, you will be able to pay for service. All of the teenagers will appreciate that. I think there are new things coming to us. It's good for our youth and it will may help them stay in this village instead of leaving it. experience from the project uh, there are a few first of all the motivation is the key factor it's not about the cost we found out that the cost is not the driver uh, the question visiting the people yes it plays some role but uh, again this is not the key driver what is the key driver is the motivation uh, we could uh, see that for example the seniors were not so excited about getting and using the services so they are happy with uh, receiving the pension, having some nice chat with the postman, and that's it. Uh, on the opposite, uh, looking at the young generation, the kids in the school, they were excited and everybody wanted the card. It's something new for them. They feel the responsibility. They feel that they can do something. And uh, so what we would make as a conclusion, or one of the conclusions is that uh, we should not approach through pensioners, which was actually one of the ideas that uh, was considered. We should approach uh, the villages through the schools. This can be very successful. Another topic that is important is that uh, we need support from uh, the government because uh, many institutions uh, or many companies, let's say, are hired by the government and if we don't uh, make the conditions that uh, these companies allow to do the cashless payments, then again, we will stay with the cash forever. And uh, some people tell us, well, we, we cannot force the, the companies to, to make cashless. And I'm talking, for example, about the marshrutka, about the transport. Uh, it is exactly opposite. The, the cities, the villages, when they hire the companies for the public transport, they can put as a condition, like you can work for us, but you need to make cashless as a, one of the options for the payments for the people who use it. So what I would like is uh, to ask you for the support. In private bank, we think that the fin inclusion is very important for Ukraine, for the development of the country. And... Uh, we would like to be, as a private bank, one of the front runner in this effort. And we are looking for partners to go together with us. So I would like to call for the companies, I would like to call for the institutions, join us. Stop talking, start doing. Thank you. Interesting. Motivation, um, I have to ask you later on on trust, but motivation is interesting starting with schools and support from government. So it's really government can drive, government has a huge role to play in the economy and the government can drive. And the third theme I heard is also looking for partners. So the continuation we heard in Jamaica, the the, the private private partnerships. Um, let me pass that on to straight away to Pavel because he was your private private partner this initiative. Um, so why don't you tell us more what MasterCard is now doing in Ukraine? Yes, thank you. So first, as I'm sitting to other Pavel, and we have the ha same hairstyle, I'm the Pavel from MasterCard, that there is no confusion. Uh, yes, um, no, actually... One, one, has a, one has glasses, the other one doesn't. True, I need to take mine. <laughs> <laughs> now, seriously, um, I think what, what there was one slide I, oh, I wanted to share with you as... as, as what I want, that's it. Um, thank you. Um, we've been discussing about many things so far, and, and, and what I was thinking maybe is to try to summarize and to bring in what could we do for now and for the future in, in Ukraine. Many things have been uh, uh, done, and, and many examples like public transportation or even festivals, which 
at that time when we started working on that, and, and first time I came to Ukraine to, with this thought was around 11 years ago, we didn't think about that much about financial inclusion. We thought more about fun. Now, it appeared that this is quite a powerful tool to include the young people. Not to include that they don't have financial tools, but to include them that they use them, that they trust them, that they see a lot of, uh, of, of values and, and benefits. And in the last um, 11 years, I can say that uh, Ukraine, in terms of payment and the advancement of retail banking, is really on top. And, and sometimes I'm even, even, even laughing because I'm Polish, so to, to the Polish uh, colleagues, uh, to the banks, to the, uh, to the merchant community, that actually Ukraine is very much advancing, taking into account the en environment and, and some limitations. And even in contactless payments done by mobile, uh, I'm proud that Poland is quite good, but Ukraine is ahead. So there are many things that have been done super well, and the discussion, I think, is more what's next. Because I see we are reaching certain moment that we need to change the way how we operate, how we do, how we run, how we develop electronic payments. And, and we see it, uh, financial inclusion goes hand in hand with digital inclusion. Sometimes digital inclusion goes a little bit ahead and helps financial inclusion. Sometimes financial inclusion helps digital inclusion because actually what, what we see is how can we create a situation that every Ukrainian citizen can leave home with one front-end device, it could be mobile phone, and has their functionalities that go beyond payments. Because then we build trust in not the technology. I don't think we need to spend that much time on building trust in technology. It's like we will start thinking about airline industry that we need to convince people that air aircrafts are secure. I don't think we need to go that direction. I think we need to build trust in whenever you go, wherever you are, you can use this device for multiple reasons, multiple purposes, not just payment. Actually, payment is not the most exciting thing. Buying is a great thing. Payment, I don't know. I'm, some people like paying, but most like buying things. So how can we make this payment model moment exciting on the one side? We don't need to talk about security. To some groups, we still need, right? We need to educate them that this is, this is for sure a security uh, uh, matter as well, meaning you can feel secure. But actually, we see security is important, but we need to talk also about enjoying the moment and creating the benefits, the mental and the monetary benefits, if needed, to the consumers that they, they, they use uh, payments. Now, what I see is the next stage is not about us running in isolation. I think it's not anymore. Because the next stage is financial inclusion for me is not only about the consumer, maybe even more to start with micro and SMEs. Because if we don't cover this part of the ecosystem, the people will not have this trust, confidence that whenever they leave their home, they can pay. Usually it's not good to give examples from your own territory, but I, I have my parents living in the similar village. Actually, it's not even village. There are three houses. And the next village is two and a half kilometers. My mother goes to shopping to this one store. There's only one store with a bike, with a phone. That's it. She I recently talked to her when she visited me, and we talked about this, and she said, I don't need cash when I'm at home, because I go and I fix all the things, either through my mobile banking or through my mobile phone. Uh, so how can we reach this? And then the next step beyond just payments and banking, and here, the whole topic of EID is, I think, of a, of a most importance because EID, as was discussed earlier, will help us on simplified, quick, remote onboarding. On onboarding of the SMEs and micros to accept electronic payments, not only electronic payments, because I think forcing or limiting is not the way to manage and to develop, but giving this comfort that sitting here, I can onboard and I can get my acceptance device and my account and my payment device instantly almost, meaning the, the payment, and easily within three, five minutes. If we get there and people feel comfortable, then we will be able to reach the next stage. 
But this is not a one player, two players, three players game. It's the entire ecosystem with multiple players that address different needs of the, cons of the consumers or of the retail uh, society to achieve this, this goal, as I see, that an average Ukrainian citizen can leave the home maybe still with cash, but the cash will sit in the pocket for ages, but will use the electronic payments because it's exciting, because it's funny, because it's secure, because it's smart, because of many reasons I have to have this device with me. And as I said, this is now, uh, I think, a, a play of all of us, the regulators, the private uh, entities, the different par participants, to create this culture that actually it's fancy, it's great not to use cash, not forcing people you don't, you cannot use the cash, because I think that's not the best way, but it's exciting, it's fancy, it's, it's a good thing to pay electronically. And this is, I think, the destiny and the target of all of us. It's not of one or two entities. And who could help with this with us? That's, I think, is something that it's an open question and the question should be addressed by, by us. And agree, talking we can talk, but doing is better. And even sometimes making some mistakes, as long as we run fast, is quicker getting us there than talking. So. I see I have still three minutes, but I will give it for the conversation. <laughs> well done, okay. I can see you're almost like the you're visionary now today. You want the one digital device. So this conversation is shifting from financial inclusion into digital economy, which is fine. I'm just flagging it. Uh, and it's, of course, interesting to have the one. And, but that was behind us, we saw this morning, on the India stack. The India stack is based on the digital ID and will simplify many things. And that's, yes. I think, a good question is, this is more, hopefully there's people in government sitting yes. here because it's a question yeah. not really, it's a much wider question than financial yeah, inclusion. Yeah, yeah. Uh, why I said this, because we always, as human beings, look at the others and try to copy them and replicate them. What I have seen so far in payments in Ukraine, Ukraine was leapfrogging many countries. So that's why, yes, we should do financial inclusion, but maybe we can do more. And only our imagination or the behavior of thousand years is limiting us. Let's try not to be limited by ourselves. That's what I was thinking about, to just go beyond that. I agree with you. You think far ahead of us, and you've introduced fun as motivation to answer that was um, Piotr's question. So, I'm very frustrated. I thought I was employed recruiter as moderator because of my German background, and that I would be using German disciplines to keep everybody on 10 minutes. But these guys are all quicker. I have nothing to do. So I will pass on immediately to Pavel then to go on and tell us about still continuing on the cashless theme. Um, and you now have a challenge. So your, your, your name's brother, Pavel, said, Ukraine is ahead of Poland and cashless. Is that true? Um, well, absolutely. Uh, Ukraine is very innovative uh, and we, uh, we also want to be as innovative uh, as you are, uh, of course. And that's why I, I would like to share with you our experience, uh, how we deal with uh, uh, financial inclusion. Uh, and what we do in Poland uh, in order to address uh, fighting uh, with financial exclusion through development of cashless uh, payments. I have a pleasure to represent uh, Cashless Poland Foundation, uh, organization that has been established by a private sector, uh, but with very strong uh, cooperation with the government. So we operate in a public-private formula, and without the government, uh, it wouldn't happen. But let me let me share with you uh, what kind of challenge we we had. Uh, even though we are uh, quite innovative, almost all cards are contactless. Uh, Ninety-nine percent of terminals are contactless. Uh, on the market, there are more than forty million payment cards. So actually, almost all Polish citizen has payment card in its wallet. But the, there was a problem. The problem was that uh, three years ago, in 2016, uh, almost 80% of active point of sales didn't accept payment cards at all. Of course, it, wa it wasn't a case of big cities like, like Warsaw, but if you go to the countryside, you uh, could figure out that 
it was really almost impossible to find a store uh, or merchant that accept payment cards. Uh, therefore, we we wanted to understand why uh, this happened, why merchants are so hesitant, suspicious even to innovative payment instruments. And we have made a, a number of researchers in cooperation with leading uh, payment consultancy, consultancy in Poland. Uh, and we have figured out uh, many different reasons. Many of them have a very psychological, cultural background, but we have, uh, we have figured out that there is one very easy to address, perception of a high price of the acquiring service. Perception because the price is never the, uh, the case, it's, it's never a problem, because uh, as we know, the benefits from the cashless payments exceed the costs. But there is this barrier that we wanted to address. So the group of market stakeholders, banks, acquirers, payment card organizations, Polish Bank Association, but in cooperation with the government, uh, we, we wanted to design the solution that would address this, this problem, this perception of high costs. And after uh, several months of, uh, of works, uh, we have designed the solution. And what is the solution? The solution is really, really, really easy. Terminal, payment terminal for free for one year for every entrepreneur, for every SME that has never accepted payment cards. And uh, this free period covers not only um, cost of terminals, but also cost of transactions. And every uh, entrepreneur, every SME can uh, receive up to three terminals. So this is, this is a solution. And in order to uh, operate this solution, uh, payment cash, uh, cashless payment, uh, cashless Poland Foundation has been established by private sector, but in cooperation with, with, uh, with the government. So the foundation is the heart of this uh, solution. And uh, we are not only a technical, uh, uh, technical mechanism to transfer money from the banks, acquires to, uh, to the market, but we also undertake marketing activities because we believe that uh, promotion of cashless economy, cashless payments is very, very, very important. Therefore, we have uh, launched a very intensive marketing campaign on radio, TV, uh, in digital channels, Mm, uh, and many other. We also educate very intensively in the market and we have achieved critical mass, which is very important to promote uh, cashless payments. Well, and after 15 months of uh, operation of our program, we have substantial uh, achievements. We have placed more than 150,000 new terminals in the market. And uh, taking uh, into account the fact that uh, in, in the whole market, the, uh, in, at the end of 2018, there were 800,000 terminals, 20% of this uh, whole aggregate constitutes terminals from the program. And uh, at the end of this year, we, ho we hope to achieve the 1 million terminals in the market. And you need to know that in 2017, we had 16 terminals per 1,000 inhabitants, uh, which was far below EU average, which, which is about 23. Uh, this year, we will achieve or even exceed EU average. Uh, and within the next three years, we hope, to, we hope to be in the league of the most advanced countries in terms of payment infrastructure. So uh, I can say that our program is very successful uh, and uh, I would like to show you one of our TV spots promoting, uh, promoting, oh, we need voice. <laughs> Panie Adamie, zapraszam. Um, ale ja gotówki zapomniałem. Dzisiaj kartę mam, ale pani nie ma... Terminala? Już mam. I może pan płacić bezgotówkowo. 
O! Super! Dołącz do programu Polska Bezgotówkowa i nie płać za terminal. Aha. Polska Bezgotówkowa. Wygoda dla Ciebie i Twoich klientów. Szczegóły na polskabezgotówkowa.pl So if you see more spots, you need to go to our YouTube channel polskabezgotówkowa.pl. Thank you very much. Yeah, I have a question for you on this one, but it's not that I'll ask you afterwards to make sure we, otherwise it'd be unfair. We have, so we've heard a lot of private sector, lots of new initiatives, lots of new products, initiatives, transport, metro, fun festivals, so on. So um, I'd like to pass on to Utam and hope he will give us a bit of a different perspective. And you need the clicker. Thank so you. I'm hoping that Utam will show us a different side to this. So why do people go for this and how to increase trust, which for, for me, one of the key challenges. We can increase awareness, we can convince, motivate, but how do you actually increase trust? Absolutely. Thank you so much, Rolf. And uh, I'm taking off from, we started the panel discussion with him presenting on trust, Roman from the Central Bank, and I'm going to finish with trust. So for, if you want sustainable financial inclusion, right, trust is very important, and the consumer must, must feel comfortable that the money he saved in his lifetime is safe. If there is no safety of that money, financial inclusion will not happen and he will not use some of the digital platforms which my colleagues talked of here. So that's number one. Visa, you know, in, I work in Visa, for, I've been working in Visa for 23 years, okay? And we know better than anybody else that trust is critical to business success. And Forbes rated us as, as the fourth most regarded company in the world and number one in financial services in understanding trust. So we, we said, decided, what do we need to do out here, right? You know, we want sustainable financial inclusion. We said, let's go back and unpack trust. Trust means different things to different people. So the first thing we did is, let's go unpack trust. What are the drivers which influence customer behavior? And then use those drivers to build products and services to make sure that there's sustainable inclusion happening around the, around the world. That's number one. The second one is I want to talk about is trust builds loyalty. I said I work in Visa for 23 years. I use Visa, right? But I don't use Visa just because I work in Visa. I use it when I need it. So I travel abroad, I come to Ukraine. I was last week in Nigeria. I use the Visa card because you know I'm you know, sure that my card will work and my money is accessible. And I'm also sure that I'm protected if I lose, you know, if there's fraud or there's any misuse of my card. So trust builds loyalty, right? But I don't do it just because I work in Visa. That's one. The second one is absence of trust leads to disengagement. You know, if in a situation where a consumer has a bad experience and then his trust in his banking relationship or his financial institution goes down, and we've noticed that 54% of consumers stop using the product and 48% of consumers move to alternate options. Some of them even go back to cash. So that's very, very important. So let me give you an example from South Africa, right? In South Africa, we, you know, over a period of one year, we tracked a group of two groups of consumers. And in the two groups, in the sixth month, one group of consumers actually had declines from their institution and the card did not work. In the first panel, you know, Greta talked about contactless failures, you know, in Ukraine, for example. So when that, you know, decline started happening of authorizations, it's, it's in December 2017, in the next six months, the consumer stopped using the card or decreased the usage of cards, and there was a $357 million of loss of spend, which moved away from that institution, either to alternate options, or in some cases to cash, 357 million. And then uh, almost a drop of 35% in activation. So that's, that's a huge loss for the institution simply because they did not have reliability on their products. So that brings me now to the trust index. The research we did to unpack trust and the index which was developed. So we went to eight countries in Simia, which is Central Europe, Middle East and Africa. That's the region I work in. 
And we went across the eight countries, defined 42 statements, of which all reflect some form of trust, then narrowed it down to 14 statements, and then arrived at a conclusion that these are, there are five factors which determine trust for consumers in this, in this, in this region. The first one is reassurance. 32% of you know, the weightage of trust is reassurance. That is, people want swift resolution of issues. If I have a problem with my card, or I have a problem with the transaction I'm reflecting on my statement, then I want quick resolution. I was coming into this meeting, and I saw my statement on my card. I was in Nigeria last week, I told you. My statement came in today. I saw a $600 charge, which I did not do. I was there all for 18 hours, from the hotel to the bank and back to Dubai. But I had a $600 charge. I hope my bank will resolve it very swiftly. Second, when there's fraud happening, they want the money back. They want protec protection. Consumer protection was again referred to in the first panel. And three, they want protection of personal data. They do not want misuse of personal data. So reassurance is very important. Number one priority or the, you know, the driver of trust. The next was transparency. Transparency is extremely important. Full visibility of transaction details. I talked about my experience this morning. The, the amount, the date of the transaction, the merchant name was all available to me to see. That's one. Second, people have, thanks to mobile phones, you've got used to instant confirmation of every transaction. I get an email confirmation, I get an SMS confirmation, I get an in-app confirmation, I can log into mobile banking and see it. So people are saying, I want instant confirmation like they want instant transfer of money. And lastly, be regularly informed of security. Security is important. Identity is important. You know, and I, have, I worked in India for a long time. I worked in the government India stack and the Aadhaar project. And biometrics came in. And you know, I joined 23 years ago. We had only 50 million bank accounts in, in India. Now, India has a billion bank accounts. 500 million of them opened with, in a paperless, instant manner using biometrics. So very, very important. Inform me about security. Prove to me it's successful. So reassurance is so well linked to transparency. The third one was expertise. They want to know you're constantly staying ahead of the risks which is coming due to technology, right? Technology brings innovation. Technology also brings risk, cybersecurity. So consumers want to know they're dealing with the best. They want to make sure they're protected. And that's where Visa plays an important role. Irrespective of where the country is in terms, in terms of regulation in protecting against fraud, Visa tries its best to put international standards and apply it consistently across different markets. Second, they want to know that they're experts in payments. They want to know leaders are helping them in driving financial inclusion and security. And then, of course, there's strong identity, verific identity verification. Reliability and social validation are small. I'll skip that in the interest of time. So now I'll jump into breaking that trust down to the eight countries, OK? So if you look at those eight countries, the SIMIA average here, I'm standing up because I want to point it, is 62%. Ukraine is at 56%. So it's the lowest in SIMIA in, in the trust index. And it refers to some of the things the panel members talked of. The three priority areas I told you is reassurance, transparency, and expertise. Reassurance is 49%. So what could it be? It could be due to consumers not having protection when they report fraud or they report a, a misuse of their card, the bank not responding fast enough. Maybe there's no zero liability offered to them which gives them their money back. Or it could be several banking crises which this economy has seen over the last 20 years. As a result, the reassurance is very low. So I really want to see, working with the central bank, if we can initiate a you know, program to really drive that reassurance up. What can we do? and build up products and services and a regulation to have sustainable reassurance. And Peter, I'll take you up on the offer to work with you on, on this aspect. Similarly, transparency. They want to know what happened to the card or the bank account, what really you know, caused this misuse. So being transparent is important. And three is expertise. It is so important that the leading brands who have reputation of trust, who have reputation of handling you know, these kind of you know, difficult situations, are leading and in the forefront partnering financial institution and the central bank out here. Quickly jumping to the same index for e-commerce transactions. And here you'll find it, you know, I, I want to point three things here. 
Ukraine is doing well, where clearly digital payments is scoring over cash by nearly 9 percentage points versus 10 percentage points for Simia. So you're in the regional average. But the best market is South Africa, where 16 percent prefer digital payments to cash. But look at UAE. UAE is a very cash-heavy market, and cash and delivery is very popular. So digital payments and cash are on par. A lot of work there to you know, promote digital payments. Look at Egypt, the worst in the region where you know, cash is superior to digital payments because they do not have cards or mobile phones working for e-commerce. So very clearly, this reflects the, the progress of innovation and technology in these markets. And as the panel member said, Ukraine is doing fantastically well. Last point which I want to highlight is about contactless payments. We talked of contactless being very successful in Ukraine. But you'll be surprised that in the trust index, you know, contactless, while the region is 62, Ukraine comes on trust index uh, on contactless as 58% compared to all of the digital products and 54% on, on reassurance. And there are three reasons for it. One reason is the fact that when it was first launched, there's a number of failures due to technology taking time to settle down. That's one. The second one is about you know, people feeling uncomfortable seeing videos. There were a number of videos floating when we did this trust index study, which talked of contactless cards being misused. People could take a terminal to your pocket and scan the card, and your account would be debited. So finally, when it came to deciding between trust and convenience, people chose trust because they didn't want the card to be misused. So as a result, there is still doubt on contactless. And we really need to make sure we drive on the success, but address the trust factor and build products and services and regulations around it. Last parting thoughts, right? Trust can happen by enabling consumers. And reassurance is the key. Reassurance is the pillar. So that pillar can be built, you know, addressed when we build products and services and regulation to A, focus on consumer education. Without consumer education, without financial literacy, financial inclusion will not happen. Make sure zero liability. Provide me the you know, convenient comfort that my money is safe. That $600 I, I lost this morning will come back to me. I want that comfort of zero liability. And regulations have to step in. Because Greta said in the morning that technology and innovation is moving very fast. Regulation is not keeping pace. When regulation is not keeping pace, that's where the card networks have come in and said, zero liability is a must for everybody. So that's the baseline. Three, biometrics. Get into a facial recognition, biometric identity to make sure consumers are protected. And lastly, transaction controls. With that, you know, one company can't do it. Visa alone cannot do it, as the panel member said. And Peter said it so well. Step forward, all of you partner with me like MasterCard has done. So I think one company can't do it. If a rising tide will happen when all of us partner together, contrib contribute together, and sustainable financial inclusion will happen, and business and the economy will thrive. In Visa, we are committed to the long-term sustainable financial inclusion in the Ukraine, and we will do everything to invest to make sure digital payments, financial inclusion comes to the doorstep of every Ukrainian household. Thank you. All right, <clears throat> six extremely interesting presentations. Um, I, I could ask them questions for hours, believe me, I love this. Um, and if you've ever seen BBC Hard Talk, so I'd love to ask really like Stefan Sacker the hard questions. But let me give you a chance first. So I have one over there, and I'm going to grab one of the microphones here. Do we have a microphone to pass around? All right, good. Is it okay to ask in English? Yes, of course. Uh, thank you very much for your brilliant presentations. I have two questions. Uh, the first question is uh, to the representatives of Ukrainian banks, so Shad Bank and Privet Bank. And I'm very grateful for the uh, last presentation from uh, Visa uh, on what the trust of, of consumer means. And you have presented us very nicely uh, how uh, your banks move Ukrainian population towards cashless, uh, how you improve access to financial services, but also um, building on the previous panel uh, where uh, 
where we found out that financial inclusion is not only about giving and having access, but also about usage of financial services and keeping those people in financial services. So to me, it's also about uh, transparent cost. It's about simple and suitable products. It's about how you interact with customers and resolve their issues. Uh, it's about data protection. So uh, could you please el elaborate more on this, uh, not only regarding transactional services, but lending, saving services? In general, what is your approach towards treating customers fairly and keeping them in financial system? And my second question is uh, um, to the representative of Poland. Um, uh, our recent survey on financial literacy showed that Ukraine has uh, the lowest score on financial literacy among OECD countries. It was according uh, to OECD methodology. Uh, but we share this last place with Poland, which has the same score. Are you worried about this? And what do you do about this? Thank you. Well done. That's good. Hard top question. So let me start off first with the with Ukrainian uh, banks, with Oshad, and then with Privat Bank to answer what are they doing about data protection. Дякую дуже за запитання. Ну, по-перше, дійсно, ви праві в тому, що зараз споживач вимагає простоти. Is going to aid in financial inclusion. In our mobile app, we count the number of clicks it takes to reach a certain transaction, and we compare ourselves against our competitors in the domestic market and outside. We have business processes which try to keep them simple, and people would not put would not have to put signatures on every page. So we do work on simplification because it is the current demand. The second thing is the marketing policy. Previously it was different, now everything is a lot simpler. We stopped communicating with people using the language of actors or some kind of staged approach. So we now work with real people from the real community if we speak about entrepreneurship, then we speak with the entrepreneurs who get our services and assistance and it helps them do their business. So our marketing communication has become more human focused and it's a real deal for them. So I think it aids in the cause of financial inclusion. So simplification and communication with customers is an important thing. We communicate with them using a different language. We do it in the social media. The number of followers on Facebook has exceeded 100,000. We are the bank number one in this regard. So we work a lot in order to reach out to the customers and share our ideas with them. But there are a lot more things to be taken care of. Speaking of lending, I know you're looking into that a lot. And there you get lots of things. There are financial institutions, banks, you get a lot of information. Sometimes there is not enough reliable information about the effective rate or commission or whatever. So it all should be made clear to customers for the sake of equal conditions, equal competition. So those banks who offer best services should be the leaders, should be on the top. So That's the principle. The transparency, data protection. Uh, first of all, I would like to say that, uh, of course, all the banks, not only private bank, have to follow the law and all the instructions that are coming from the national bank. And uh, I can tell you, as I worked in different countries, that uh, the law uh, from this point of view in Ukraine is actually much more strict than in many other countries. So this is the legal part. But actually, I think that uh, the most important feedback as concerning how the bank work is the feedback of the market. And uh, the market will not work with the bank or with the organization that is not trusted. There are questions about the transparency, there are the questions about the data protection. And uh, we believe as a private bank that we go in the right way 
why we believe so, like as you may know, we have achieved uh, 22 million clients and uh, just last year in 2018 we have added one and a half million new clients. If there would be any issues with the topics that you have mentioned, why would they come to us? Okay, <clears throat> that's a statement, so the market is better, but still the state provides the laws and the regulations you have to respect, that's the basis, the market then ultimate test. Um, Th on, so thank you for this question regarding financial literacy or low level of financial literacy in Poland. We, we are absolutely aware of this fact and it was one of the reasons why we, we have decided to establish this central entity of uh, payment of, of, of cashless payments in Poland, which is Cashless Poland Foundation. Uh, and uh, a fair part of our budget is dedicated to educational programs promoting uh, awareness of uh, cashless payments in many social groups. Uh, we, we work with local governments, we work with schools, we work with universities. Uh, what, what, what's also important that the program uh, itself is only not only dedicated to uh, small and medium enterprises. Uh, after six months ago, we decided to include um, all kinds of entities, including governmental entities. Uh, so, for example, local government may also apply for free terminal. So uh, our, uh, our activities covers not only transfer of money to the acquirers in order to install free terminals, but we also uh, put our attention into education. Just a quick follow-up question. Is this at all commercially viable to provide so many terminals for free? It's a long-term investment uh, and uh, market responsibility. Uh, and actually it's win-win-win situation because at the end uh, of the day, all parties uh, benefits. Um, payment service providers, issuers, acquirers, payment uh, card organizations, but also customers because they have a choice. They can uh, choose to pay cash or cashless in every point of sale in Poland. This is our vision. This is our aim. Oh, okay, good. So, we well, had a question over there. Wow, fantastic. Then, anyone looks in the room, we have... Can you keep your questions? So, I'll do one, two, three, four. But please, make sure you try to really... Straight, a straight question, no comments, just what's the question? Make it as difficult as possible. Okay, first one, the gentleman over there. Thank you. Michael Dotsenko, U.S. Ukraine Business Council. Uh, my question is to MasterCard and Visa, uh, both our members. Uh, in your experience, and maybe, um, uh, maybe Pavel Vidovsky from Poland could also comment on that. Uh, when it comes to you working in uh, various countries uh, where there is lack of uh, internet access in rural areas, because that's one of the big problems here in Ukraine, uh, what, in your experience, is the role of central government versus local government in uh, either, if it's central government, maybe forcing everybody uh, in some way uh, or encouraging everybody through maybe creation of some sort of a fund uh, to do the last mile, as they call it, you know, to get the internet to the village, to the farm out there. Uh, or is there a bigger role in the local communities asking for this and somehow working with the businesses? Uh, what, what's the optimal model that you have seen in order to get the internet out there so that people then can start using the terminals uh, or, uh, or other means of payment? Thank you. Okay, maybe I start. So. I think it's uh, everything we do, we do for a purpose, right? To solve something. If we have a problem with the internet, then the question is how we can extend certain activities. To my knowledge, even I'm not living in Poland, but Pavel mentioned there was no problem with the internet. So maybe that's why, maybe it was easier, right? To, to deploy certain services. But I think it's also in, in, in the interest of the government, every government, to deploy the internet coverage and internet accessibility because it's payment and internet as a prerequisite to digital inclusion as well. So it's more of a discussion how we want to solve it together to help different participants than, oh, that's a problem we cannot solve. I think everything is solvable if we talk enough and we agree that this is something just beyond a short-term thinking. That's what Pavel mentioned. 
the foundation is a long-term investment, but I think what the banks start seeing is also extending the scope of activities with the micro and SMEs. It's not about only payment. There are a lot of other activities the bank can drive because they see more transactions, they see more traffic, they know the customers better to, to make it uh, also uh, financially viable. I mean, people are not throwing money just for the sake of creating something that is nice. It is good to create something nice, but it must be sustainable, as, as, as the colleague said. Yeah, if, if I can just add to it, right? Let me give you an example of Africa. Africa is really very, very poor in terms of penetration of digital or, or even payment products. And, uh, but mobile payments have picked up. You know, you talked of M-Pesa in Kenya. The, the reason for that is because of lack of internet access, they have forced USSD banking. And I believe that if mobile phone penetration is there, but there's no internet, then you can mandate USSD banking. And that's one area where regulators have struggled around the world. They've not been allowed, they've not been able to force mobile operators to allow USSD banking. So that's one example where it has worked in Africa with USSD banking. The second point is they have used agent banking as well. Agent banking have liquidity given to them and they're able to give offline transactions and using data scoring the customer. So you do offline, but when you go online, then you're debited. And if you don't have money in your account, your credit score goes down. So there's a mix of a USST using a mobile operator collaboration and using liquidity management and agent network to do offline transactions. And I can talk a little more you know, offline if you wanna know more about what's been done. But those are two important levers to drive it to the last mile in every household. I, I, I think your question has a, has a broader, bro, broader sense uh, and it relates to the philosophy of, of state. Uh, whether it's easier to push a market uh, for legal obligation to do something or it's better to encourage market to design the economic uh, solution that would, that would work. In Poland we have designed a solution that works without any, any regulation. Okay, we had... Yes, go ahead, it doesn't matter. Whoever gets the microphone first, to the, uh, to the lady then, please, she goes first. Thank you very much. Um, I'm, I'm representing the business area, so I'm from business, I'm a tax advisor in Ukraine. And I have a pretty simple question. Um, in my opinion, Ukrainians are very smart people, especially entrepreneurs. They count money very well. And uh, I appreciate the uh, speech of Pavel Vidovsky, who explained what's interrupt people to use cashless uh, services. But uh, I know two points when people stop using a uh, banking system and start using cash. First of all, it's big banking fee when you're using terminal. Uh, sometimes, for example, it's travel agency. I have small commission if I m make travel business and uh, my commission is $50, but banking commission, about 3% of total amount. So I'm losing money when I'm using terminals. It's really so. And um, uh, I know at travel agencies, they put terminal because it's the law. I have to have the terminal. Each store in Ukraine has, has to have that. So... Um, I'm putting terminal because I'll get a fine if I will, the tax inspector will come, uh, but I'm not using it. And when somebody's come with a card, I'm saying, oh, it doesn't work now. I'm sorry. That's probably something wrong with connections because I'm losing money. I'm not interested. Can we do something? That was the first. And another one opinion about senior people. Uh, when you're dead, you can't use cashless. <laughs> So uh, senior people uh, put money into a socks or I don't know, like under the pillow. And if you're dead, you can make like a uh, small notice that my money is there. You can burn me, right? Like make all this um, formless. But um, if I have money on a card, my relatives will wait six months to get money and Maybe I have no relatives, so it's a real problem for cashless, I think so. Thank you. Okay, just because we're running out of time, I would like to ask um, Pavel, since you have the experience from the village on how to convince seniors, not Pavel, Piotr, on the, so to answer the second part, a question, so how to convince seniors, the first part of the question was, 
uh, really how to bring down cash really fees and terminals, I think that was the issue. So Let the, me answer the first question. Okay. So concerning the first question, yes, you are absolutely right that in some cases there are high fees for using of the post terminals. Uh, the question is quite complex. Uh, if you look at other countries, there are basically two ways how this topic was resolved, if it was resolved. First of all, the fees in Ukraine are not so much different from many other countries, first statement. Second, uh, in some countries, the fees were driven down by the market because uh, there is a huge competition and uh, the competition does not allow for having high fees. Uh, in other countries, uh, the fees uh, were decided by some government institution and basically put the limit or the cap on what kind of fees can be charged by whom or if the transactions, for example, have to be free of charge. So we have uh, two options. Either the government has to step in, one option. Uh, option number two, that uh, the competition on the banking market will increase and then the market will go down by itself. Дякую. Я би ще додав до того, що казав Петр, що потрібно співставляти вартість. You have to pay a lot of extra money to keep it going this way. Same is true of the companies. I guess the problem is not that cashless options are expensive. Cashless options are cheap. That's the problem, I think. And if it's going to be getting cheaper and cheaper, it's going to be a benefit to entrepreneurs. But if interchange keeps going down in banks, then they will have customers cover the costs. You have to think of the average check size. In this country it is 30 times less than in Poland. And we also need to think of subscription fee for accounts. With us it's almost all free because we still have a high competition. In many countries you pay for the account like 20, 30, 50 euro per month and the bank does everything else for you. We still haven't had it. There is an existing limit of solvency of population. So it's a disputable matter as to what we should do first. I think we need to work more on the cashless circulation. It should be made something which is in line with the production cost and all of the companies would see benefits for them from it. Cashless will be getting cheaper and cheaper over time and it will just take some time to happen. In this war between cash and cashless, cashless will gain the upper hand, maybe, but it's just a matter of time. But sometimes we can see companies are not ready to use the terminals to make payments. It's an issue of taxes. If you pay taxes, then... Well, if it were a benefit, like if people wanted to pay taxes, then it would not be a major issue at all. Cashless in every business model looks cheaper compared to everything else. If you think of all of the costs which are included in the financial model, if we're thinking of administrative regulation, it sort of contradicts the current stance taken by the National Bank. It's not a sustainable model because anyway, one day it's going to be destroyed because the market has to be based on market. Yes, thank you. That's always the issue when it comes to cashless is to, um, taxation, <clears throat> tax avoidance. And so how to bring that down, make it easier. Uh, difficult questions. Um, let me, we're running out. Let me take the gentleman now. Yes, go ahead. And then we had another gentleman here over there. No? Uh, Andriy Rachuk, wow. uh, Ministry of uh, but uh, I will speak in Ukrainian, from your permission. Uh, 
My question goes to the NBU people and Ukrainian banks, I think. It's about financial inclusion. Utam has rightly said that it is based on education in many ways, awareness raising, and we have to think of covering the youth with the education efforts. Peter earlier suggested that private bank has a service like they issue junior cards for kids. Once you're six years of age, you can get this. Other banks do not have it, as far as I know. So if we speak about financial inclusion, we need to cover the children. We need to tell them how to use the services while they're kids. Nowadays, kids can handle all of, all of these gadgets and devices. So, if you allow them to see how can they save, how can they, how can they do this and that, then it's going to be a benefit. Of course, it should be done under parental control, but over time it will help increase financial literacy. But here's the thing. I've got two kids, and I want them to have these cards. They are 11 and 14 year olds. But I cannot do it right now, because the debit card can be issued starting the age of 16, a credit card starting the age of 18. Does the National Bank have any plans to do some simplification, so that similar services, like those of private bank, could be found everywhere else in other banks? so that they could issue some debit cards to kids, trial cards to kids, whatever. Any ideas about that? Well, the National Bank is open to all kinds of proposals from the business community and individual banks and financial institutions, and we're ready to look into further simplifications in these things. As far as I can see, it is out there. It's just up to an individual bank to see if they should offer this or not. You need to shop around the market for solutions and use them. I'd like to make a comment saying that this step and other steps should be a part of the roadmap, which should become the national program for improved financial literacy. It's a very comprehensive endeavor. and. I guess every participant in this panel is doing something to increase the rate of financial literacy. In this country, we need concerted efforts in this. So far, there hasn't been any, but I think that's the way to go. It will help us reach new heights. I'm, I'm looking at the time. I'm looking at somebody to help me here from the conference organizers. We are now already 30 minutes past the official time. Uh, so... Um, Perhaps, as much as I know many people like to ask more questions, I would just like to ask one question myself, and perhaps we, then we take a break for lunch, if that's fine. Uh, uh, good, okay, so, as no rejections, no comments, so everybody agrees simply, so I take silence as consent. So, to close the panel, a question to you, since we all agree, we can't, nobody can do it on his or her own. It's possible. We need partners. So the question to each one of you, and we'll just do a quick round robin. So what is the one thing that you would like somebody else to do uh, that would actually reduce risk, improve inclusion, something where you need support from somebody else? And it could be government, central bank, public even. Uh, so it's anything. What is the one thing that you think where, that you can do, what you want, would like somebody else to do? I'll just do reverse order. If I should say one word, it's dialogue. Dialogue uh, between private sector and the uh, public sector, but also dialogue within private sector. Within private sector, there are many competitors, but they have to find a way how to uh, discuss things and go forward. This is key, dialogue. Okay. Uh, yes, I fully agree, dialogue and openness, uh, beyond just a short-term perspective. Uh, but never forget what the consumer thinks. What are the consumer limitations that cease with uh, financial inclusions and how we should address. So security on the one side, enjoyment on the 
complete other side, and there are different people that need to be addressed with different messages. We have great cooperation with uh, many cities, with uh, many organizations, and uh, that helps because in those cities, uh, the clients are happy, they work, they can pay cashless, they can enjoy the life without bothering themselves with cash and many other things. What I would like to ask is uh, for the support, for the communication and the coordination with uh, the central government and the local government so we can move forward because still there are many cities that uh, don't want to do this. And there are many reasons which for me it's very difficult to judge. But uh, if we see that there is a good solution, if we see that we can help the people, regardless if we talk about the common citizens of the cities, about the students, about uh, whoever else, then let's try to find such a solution for everybody. We are ready to provide it, but we need your support, we need your partnership. Ну, по-перше, це питання віддаленої ідентифікації. Я вважаю, це I think it's an issue of identification that's a strategic thing to this country. We need to improve the existing practices and make sure that people could totally go digital in terms of services. I'm not just speaking about banking, I'm speaking about other sectors like you get bank IDs, there are other magnetic technologies, and I think it's the way to go. We just need to complete the regulation of this stage so, this, so that this technology could become a part of daily life. It's easier to give advice here and there, but I'd like to make one more point. A lot of cash is used in paying utility bills in this country. Many people use cash for that. Why? In our application, you can make online payments. There are lots of financial companies, other banks, which allow you to use that. So many people no longer go to branches to do it. But I think we need to standardize the way in which payments are made, and it should be a single standard for all. All providers of services would have a QR or some kind of standard form so that these payments could be standard. Right now, you get 10, 20, 30,000 utilities and they use different things. And it's quite a mess and nobody can see what it, what it is. So it all should be standardized, unified um, IT services of these companies should do their part of the job implementing the regulation and then this cash area will become cashless in the bulk of it. Yeah, my suggestion is, you know, trust is uh, not competition. Trust is the baseline for financial inclusion. So my request of everybody in the room is take the trust drivers seriously. So build your products and services to address those drivers which came out through the research which your consumers are telling us. And I urge the regulator to make sure regulation also emphasizes on trust and make sure those six pillars are adequately addressed. Thank you. I was earlier saying that there are some issues with taxes in these things, but still, I'd like to see certain technologies which would not have so much of operational costs to be borne by consumers. Well, you get cardless, deviceless approaches, stuff like that. So there would be no need to go to the point of sale. They would not have to buy something expensive or to rent something in order to handle commission fees. But it all should be made a lot more convenient for both the point of sale and the client. And we all need to understand that Trust matters most, and uh, there's a need for concerted actions, and it will lead to a good end result, and we will be able to set things in motion and make progress in terms of financial inclusion in this country. 
So it is our joint project and we need to bring it to fruition. Thank you.